been divisive issue. We at Olelo Community Media hope that GMO Week will help all of us gain a better understanding of both the pros and cons of GMO so that our community can create solutions that are in the best interest of Hawaii. The GMO series is our first, but Olelo plans to air similar productions on important community issues in the future. We do not support any position on GMO, but we strongly believe that voices on both sides need to be heard. Freedom of speech and community engagement are what makes our country and our island community great. From all of us at Olelo, mahalo for watching. Aloha, and thank you for tuning into GMO Week here on Olelo. I'm Paul Udell. This week, we put a spotlight on the use and the impact of genetically modified organisms, or GMOs, on our island state. And with the help of our panelists, we've been exploring the pros and the cons of GMO. If you visit alelo.org slash GMO, you can watch on-demand programs with both pro and anti-GMO views, and even participate in the discussion by tweeting your questions to hashtag AlelloGMO. Now tonight we bring panelists from both pro and anti-GMO sides together in a debate format. We're gonna hear opening and closing statements from both views. Each is gonna be given two minutes allotted for the response, and we might be able possibly to cover close to a dozen questions. Let's hope we can. Our panelists are Adolf Helm, Dr. Dennis Gonzalv, Dean Okimoto, Bill Fries, Dr. William Steiner, and Dr. Hector Valenzua. So let's begin with an opening statement. We're gonna begin with the pro-GMO faction. Dean. Thank you. Um, first off, I'd like to thank Olelo for having this forum. Uh, I think it's a, it's a good forum to have, to have the open discussion on both sides of this issue. You know, as a farmer and as ranchers, we give our life to the land uh, so that we can provide healthy food choices for our kamaena. But to do that, we need all types of farms, big and small, rural and urban, organic and conventional, and even biotech. I want to tell you a story about a farmer that I met in Indiana. And, um, his, his story is he's a 30-year-old uh, guy, and he said he, he was about, his father was about to lose the farm. It was a 2,000-acre farm um, outside of a metropolis. It was up for sale. Developers had actually, are pound, were pounding on his door to buy the land. They were going bankrupt. Um, as a last resort, his father decided to try to grow uh, uh, sweet corn, uh, biotech sweet corn. And he, they grew it. Uh, he was able to successfully uh, grow the crop and make some money on it to the point where this happened about 10 years ago. And um, the kid that was telling me the story is 30 years old. He now is back on the farm. He has a wife and two children. Um, they're able to support both uh, farms, both families on the farm. But the beauty of it is this 2,000 acres would have gone to development. But because of this type of um, biotech uh, product, he was able to make it viable again. Um, we have fewer acres, less water, more pests, less people actually involved in product producing agriculture. More now than ever, we have a responsibility to hone our skills as stewards of the land, water and air, and to judiciously embrace proven science. Biotechnology or genetic engineering has helped our farmers remain viable. We know that biotechnology is not the solution to all agricultural problems, and we do not treat it as such. Thank you. <laughs> You're good. You quit on time. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> A bill dings, and that means it's your time. Now for the anti-GMO portions. Your turn. Uh, thanks, Paul. Yes, I'd also like to thank Alela for inviting us here. I'm, I'm honored to be here from the mainland to, to share some perspectives on GMOs. Biotechnology is often portrayed as a humanitarian enterprise that's needed to feed a growing world. But nothing could be further from the truth. Consider these facts. The biotechnology industry is made up of companies like Monsanto, DuPont, Syngenta, and Dow that have a long history of marketing hazardous chemicals, from DDT to PCBs to the infamous Agent Orange used in Vietnam. 
Since the 1990s, these pesticide firms have bought up much of the seed supply, and they use genetic engineering primarily to develop pesticide-promoting crops. They have also led the charge in patenting the seeds of life to prevent farmers from practicing the age-old art of seed saving. Monsanto alone has sued thousands of farmers and extracted many millions of dollars from them. Um, biotechnology has nothing to do with feeding the world. Uh, genetically engineered crops do not increase yield or nutrition, and the number of the world's hungry has actually increased since GE crops were introduced by several hundred million. Um, finally, Dr. Steiner and Valenzuela tell me that the biotech seed industry doesn't produce a scrap of food to feed Hawaiians, and that the same fertile land could be used to produce fresh, healthy, local food for the community. Fortunately, there are sustainable paths forward. More and more farmers and agricultural experts are realizing that the path forward to abundant and healthy crops lies in using innovative agroecological techniques to build healthy soils and control pests with little or no use of pesticides. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we're going to have a format whereby I ask a question, first of all, to you because you were most recently talking, and uh, two minutes for each side, and perhaps we can get a rebuttal in at that time. So let me, let me start with you. What scientific evidence do you have that GMOs are unhealthy, are bad for people? Um, I think the, the issue with genetic engineering is that it's a very imprecise technique that involves bringing in genes from an entirely different organism, usually from a soil bacterium, and inserting it into a crop. And the techniques that are used are very imprecise, and they cause mutations in the crop, and this can give rise to harmful unintended effects, such as increasing the levels of toxins that are naturally in the plant, or generating novel toxins, or even reducing the nutritional content of food. Another risk is allergies, food allergies, because when you introduce a new gene that produces a new protein into a crop, you increase the risk of allergic reactions. So these are some of the issues. And, and the final issue is the pesticide-promoting crops. These are herbicide-resistant crops, which are engineered to withstand direct application of often toxic herbicides. And so we find that there are greater herbicide residues in these crops, which is an additional concern. You have two minutes. What do you say? You know, I'll take uh, um, issue with the, the fact that, that the mention that uh, our way of genetic engineering is not precise. You know, we know defined genes that we're going to put into the plant, and we have methods to detect those genes in the plant. Whereas when you make a conventional cross, you, you're making whole parts of the chromosome to go in the plant. So precise is that we can monitor, we can detect the genes in the plant because we know what we're putting in the plant. I thought you were going to say something about uh, rainbow papaya. It has been around uh, for quite a while. And so there, there is a GMO which is profiting people here, correct? Absolutely, and well, I'll say that later in the show, but you know, with the rainbow papaya, it's one of the most well-characterized plants in the world. We've sequenced the genome, we know what it is, and for 15 years, people have been eating it over 250 million pounds with not a single incident. I'll give you, know, you, a, I'll give you a rebuttal if you can. There's a, there's a few dozen studies uh, that have been conducted to date that raise serious questions about the health effects of GMOs uh, with respect to the effect on, on several body organs, like the blood, the kidney, the liver. The problem is that we have not conducted the follow-up studies to determine what are the potential health effects on human beings. So we don't have a precise study? So for the GMO papaya, we have not conducted a single study to determine what are the health effects of consuming papaya on the human population. We can make statements of safety, but we, have not, we don't have the data to back those statements up. Let me, uh, let me go on to another question. Isn't there a problem when you say, uh, we don't want to label this product, when people who have suspicions about big government, about big business, and so forth, think you're hiding something? So the more 
you say, Let, let's not have to label this, the more they think you've got something to hide. Well, one, one thing, we're not saying don't label. We're saying it should be labeled on the federal level. And the reason why is, if you look at the cost factors involved, and I'm not talking about the label, I'm talking about the monitoring of this. It's on a, on a statewide level. If you're gonna do it at a state, we're talking about a population of 1.4 million people. And this state is gonna have to hire people to monitor the products coming in and telling these people, is there GMO in there? If there is, we want to know it and we want it labeled. Okay, now this is a population for a state of Hawaii of 1.4 million people. Okay, if you're going to tell Kellogg or uh, Post or any of these companies, label for Hawaii only, the two choices are going to be, one, it's going to be costly because it's labeling only for a certain a small percentage of the population. Or two, they're just going to say, nah, let's not send it. You know, so those are the kinds of issues that we talk about. On a federal level, if you're labeling, then it's spread out among billions of people. So, you know, then, then yeah, okay, then all companies will do it. So, so you're saying, oh, labeling's okay, just, but federal but government, should don't be, let the states do it. Yes. Okay. Your rebuttal with that? Well, we've, we've tried very hard to get the FDA to, to introduce labeling, and they've refused to do so because, frankly, they've been influenced by the biotechnology industry, which does not want labeling. And this is a shame because there are 64 countries in the world that have mandatory labeling for genetically engineered uh, crops and, and foods. And, you know, this is, represents at least 40% of the world's population. The United States is behind the curve on this. We're talking the European Union, Japan, Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, Brazil, and even China have labeling laws. So, you know, I agree. We, we definitely need labeling, and we wish the biotechnology industry would get out of the way. And, uh, you know, if they don't have anything to hide, they should be, um, you know, happy to advertise, you know, one of foods the, that have their crops. Yes. One of the problems in tracing possible health effects of GMOs is that the food is unlabeled. So you go to the store, you don't know what you're purchasing. So it's impossible to trace a health problem. Uh, so for people that are concerned about, about potential health effects, that's why they want that choice. We want it labeled. And if the feds are unwilling to do it, let's do it at a local level. Yeah, and Paul, can I, add, can I yes. add to that? I think what's important there today is you, you do have choices. You, you can you know, determine whether you want uh, an organic certified produce, you can go to the market, it's labeled, or you want a non-GMO certified labeled produce which you can purchase in the market. I think what's important too is the fact that European unions have, as uh, Bill stated, there's, you know, 60 plus countries. And, and you know, in, in some particular cases, you have to look at a country by country basis as to how they set up their labeling uh, processes and laws. And what's odd in some particular cases is uh, a lot of those European Union allow uh, animal feed that are genetically engineered to be consumed by uh, cattle, uh, uh, poultry, and uh, pork. And the end product that goes to the store is not labeled. So it's, it's peculiar in a sense how these labeling laws are set up in the European unions. But matter of the fact is we depend on a very stringent uh, safety program that is overseen by the USDA, the EPA, and FDA. And it's one of the most stringent programs in the world in terms of food safety. And, and by the way, you know, I mean, the FDA doesn't doesn't require the labeling because they deem these products to be safe. I mean, bottom line, that is what has happened at the FDA level. Well, one of the criticisms of that is that they're basing, and I'm saying it's true, but I'm saying the claim is made that they're basing their decisions on a research that was financed by the seed companies. No, I, I want to take issue that with papaya, we never were associated with a seed company. It was public sector scientists that did the work. That's Nobody 20, bought us out. 20 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Let, let, let me go on to something else. Some people are thinking, you're using scare tactics without a lot of scientific fact here because there hasn't been a, a lot of money poured in by you people, I take it, because you don't have the money. You don't have the money the seed companies have uh, to cough up uh, money for research. But how are you going to get the proper research to prove your point? 
Well, that is the challenge. You know, we wish that the government would actually devote some some halfway serious money to investigating these questions. It's, and you know, we've, there's been a little bit. For instance, in 2009, the EPA gave a grant to University of Chicago to explore whether the insecticidal proteins in BT corn, which is a genetically engineered corn, causes food allergies. All right. The trouble is, this is you know, 15 years after these crops were introduced to the market, and we're only now funding research to try to find out this, this important question. A lot of food allergists think that this is the case. So I think, you know, we don't have a stringent safety system. I would like to take issue with um, Adolf because the FDA, for instance, does not have any sort of mandatory safety testing program. It's a voluntary consultation process where the companies don't even have to go to FDA before they bring a crop to market. It's voluntary. All right? You can't have a stringent system if it's not mandatory and if it doesn't involve long-term animal feeding studies, again, which we do not have um, at all for the approval process. Let me go into a, a, another subject. It was raised uh, yesterday. Th there's, what, about 5% of the ag lands are being devoted to uh, this experimental right. seed product. The argument was that, yes, papaya is helping out uh, local farmers and so forth and local consumers, but those seeds are shipped out. The land is not being used to grow uh, products that are then sold here, uh, wh whatever that might be, fruit or vegetables, but those seeds are sent to the mainland instead of supplying us directly. And that, that simply uh, costs us more money because we've got to import the food. How do you answer that argument? Well, one, okay, I, I've always said that big ag has to help small ag. Okay, when, when we had the, the, the pineapple industry and sugarcane industry go away, there was, a, there was a big effort to diversify our agricultural economy. And basically it stagnated for, for years until seed corn came in and started using some of the land. And we were worried about development on this land too. Now, okay? Those were other issues that we had to deal with. But we have an infrastructure that's, that's uh, breaking down and not being taken care of. And you know, these are the things that Big Ag can help us do. Uh, bringing in our inputs is another way. Our fertilizers, our uh, drip tubing, all of these things. If it's left to small companies to do, small farmers, we're talking about bringing in pallets of things rather than containers. You know, so our costs, I mean, how are we going to do it as small agriculture if we don't have these bigger companies helping us with those types of costs going yeah. forward? And, and Paul, to add, to add to that, when you look at, you know, uh, production ag in Hawaii before, sugar and pineapple, uh, hundreds of thousands of acres they utilize. The demand on resources is huge. You look at currently the seed farmer's footprint with regards to land and water, it's very small. The footprint is small, the demand on the resources is small. I think what's important to know is that us farmers, the seed farmers along with conventional and organic farmers, we really got to get on the same page on how best to leverage our skills and knowledge to help one another. This is all about collaboration. It's all about how we can pay for cheaper water, how we can pay for cheaper land. It's all about working together, you know. And we all from Hawaii. We born and raised in Hawaii. Whether you born and raised or not, we all aloha the aina, right? And we need to work together. While uh, yes. each agricultural system has to be studied or analyzed based on its merits. Uh, so while we do want agriculture, and it's only a small percentage of land, 5%, we have to realize that this is some of the most fertile and productive land in the state uh, with, access to, with access to water. Uh, so while we do want agriculture, we also have to realize that most of the land that there is unused is buried for most of the year, that is exposed to erosion. Uh, it also receives high amounts of pesticides and, and chemical fertilizers. So who will fix down the road the environmental issues, the health issues if the people are exposed uh, to pesticide drift and contamination? Uh, so you have to ass assess what are the benefits to the community, but if something goes wrong down the, down the road, who will pay for that? Uh, just like the wheat plantations. Uh, a lot of the aquifers got contaminated from excessive amount of pesticide applications during the plantation days. Uh, so there's a lot of social costs that the, the, the taxpayer ends up having to pay uh, down the road. 
Let me ask you about the. Uh, well, yeah, sure. yeah, because I mean, <laughs> I beg to differ. Because uh, I'll tell you what, we, you. we're doing the the Cunia lands, and and you know, Monsanto gave gave uh, Hawaii Ag Foundation uh, 200 acres for small farmers to farm. Without Monsanto's help in remediating that land, because it's 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 sugar lands that were basically had to be remediated before um, their use. For that 200 acres, almost a half million dollars had to be put in of inputs to make that land usable. Okay, so if we going going forward, we're gonna we want it's good land. Okay, but yeah, there's a lot of things that that the past plantation system have put into this soil that that doesn't help us in, in growing diversified agricultural crops. And there's no way small farmers can afford some of these things. These are the types of things that we can get help from okay. these companies with. I promised you plenty of time here to answer that. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, uh, one, of the, one of the things we can do is, is support diversified agriculture to try and, uh, and build those soils up. Uh, I think that's one important aspect that makes a farmer more independent on inputs. The problem with inputs is that they have a, a finite life. Uh, you, your, your phosphates and potassiums are mineral fertilizers that are mined. Those mines are running, beginning to run out of the fertilizers. So in 100 years or 120 years, we may ha see the cost of these fertilizers so high that we can't import them to, to make these adjustments as inputs. So it would argue to me then that we need to be careful about using any crop like GM corn, which is dependent on those high inputs, or any crop uh, at all that is dependent on the high inputs, and think about how we're going to farm in the future. We need to think ahead of the game and not be in the game at this point and use the same approach that we've been using. C could I just add also that it, we talk about the you know the legacy of the sh you know the the sugarcane and the pineapple plantations, but. Today, we know that 22 restricted-use pesticides are being used on, on Kauai. Dr. Steiner and I were in, were in Kauai just this morning to talk about this problem. Restricted? Restricted-use pesticides. What mean? It means that they're especially hazardous and that special training is required to, to use them. The, the EPA doesn't allow just anyone to use them. You have to undergo training and get a license. And this is because they're more hazardous than most pesticides. Are you saying they're not doing that? Uh, well, in our view, these pesticides should not be used at all because they're, they're definitely hazardous. And I can give some examples. There's an insecticide called chlorpyrifos, which is being used in large quantities. And it's associated with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder in children, as well as Parkinson's disease. And then paraquat and atrazine are two very toxic herbicides that are being used uh, by the biotech seed companies. And you know, these, these are, are very hazardous compounds that cause real problems. But let me, let, I'll give you a chance to respond quickly if you, if you can on that. I mean, he's, he's saying that's yeah. pretty serious stuff that they're operating well, we, with over there. Restricted use pesticide, you know, when you look at it, it's, it's each pesticide had its own unique characteristics and, and you have to treat it uh, as an individual product. And to say that restricted use pesticide is more toxic than general pesticide, that's, that's false. Uh, all pesticide, if not used properly, can be toxic. And uh, so the, the idea here is, you know, we follow, meaning the seed farmers and other farmers, follow laws that oversee the use of pesticide. And that laws help us to ensure that we apply the pesticide safely to ensure there's no harm to the environment and to humans and others. And, and also, you know, our small farmers use restricted use pesticides also. Okay, and I'll tell you what, another thing is I guarantee you, if you drink um, organic pesticides and you drink chemical pesticides, they'll kill you the same way at the same time. Okay. Let, me, let me go on kind of in that area, but it's my turn to talk to you about the question, first of all. And I'm wondering about all the uh, complaints that we're hearing from people who live near uh, th these uh, seed places. And uh, people are saying, hey, the, the wind comes over. Uh, we, we got all this stuff that's blowing over here. It's hurting my kids. Uh, it's, it's hurting the environment. And how do you prove that, though? Have you got any studies? I mean, they're saying this, but have you got any studies to prove, to say you know, this is really happening? 
Well, I know, we know in general that pesticide drift is a huge issue that's never been properly regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency. And this is one area where the EPA has really fallen down and has not protected people. A lot of pesticides are, they can drift upon application while they're being applied, and then they can also volatilize days and weeks and even months after the application and then drift. All right. High wind speeds and hot temperatures can extend the drift quite a long distance in some cases with some pesticides. It can be a mile or more. And when people are exposed to this sort of drift, the EPA doesn't just hasn't established enforceable rules to prevent this sort of pesticide drift and so protect people from the health consequences. So you believe that this is happening, say, on Kauai. So, but you can't prove it yet because nobody's gone in there and done the study. So just to clarify, the way they farm is they have a plot of land. They apply several dozen, 30 to 40 pesticides to grow that crop or several crops around the area. They harvest the crop, and then that soil is going to lay bare for a period of about seven to eight months. During that period, the dust is going to blow, there's going to be runoff, the soil is going to move around. So all the dust that you see around the, the, the area, if you drive around Molokai or Kauai, may be contaminated with pesticides. The runoff may have pesticides. So we're talking about remediation. If we want to go back to those lands in 10 years, we will have to go back to, scra to, to a square one and try to remediate that soil at high capital costs. And, and Paul, I like, I, like yeah. to, I like to comment on that. I'll, I'll give you an example. Uh, my son lives on a homestead, and he lived uh, right next to uh, a seed uh, farmer that was growing seed and applying the, you know, the basic pesticide and herbicide, uh, which is you know some of the standard products that seed farmers use. And over 30 years, uh, the land apparently went back to him. This is uh, homestead land. And he decided to grow fruit trees. He grew a native uh, Hawaiian forest. He grew some coal trees for windbreaks. And those things are doing beautiful, excellent. No remediation at all. And so what I, what I want to say is, is we, as farmers, even though I grow seed corn, we, we care about the land. We care about the aina we farm on. We're not going to abuse them so that 30 years now nobody can farm them. That's, that's, not, that's yeah. not the right way to do things. And, and I, I, I've never heard of any pesticide that can drift a mile. I mean, why would, why would, anybody, why would anybody, any agency, approve a pesticide that's going to drift a mile? I mean, I, you know, there are, there are small farmers also that use these chemicals. So, I mean, my dad used to. My dad died at 88 years old. And, Paul, you've met him, right? Um, and he, he never had any ill consequences from these things. And we didn't even have the rules we have today. And over and beyond that, a big company will watch what he does more than a small farmer. I mean, these guys will follow the rules because they know it better. They're trained better. Um, they make more money doing it. So they're trained to, to use these pesticides in the correct way. Well, th there are peer-reviewed documented studies showing that, yes, pesticides, especially ones like 2,4-D, which is highly volatile, and dicamba, these are highly volatile pesticides that can definitely drift over a mile and damage crops far, far away. And it also stands to reason that if they're drifting to damage crops far away, they can also impact people. And there are, there are studies showing that the ambient uh, pesticide levels in the air, uh, in California and Washington studies have been done showing that in agricultural areas, you exceed the safety standards for some of these toxic uh, pesticides. For instance, chlorpyrifos, which is organophosphate insecticide that the EPA agrees is toxic and is trying to phase out, but hasn't succeeded yet. But um, if I could just add one, mm -hmm. one thing with the FDA, uh, I'm sorry, with the EPA, which regulates pesticides, is that they judge pesticides on a risk-benefit standard, all right, and this is by law. So if there are uh, health and environmental consequences of, of pesticides, as there often are, 
they have to be weighed against the, you know, at least claimed economic benefits of the pesticide. So that is how hazardous pesticides are approved by the EPA, because they are seen to have at least countervailing economic benefits. And it's, it's unfortunate, but that's the law that we have at the federal level. And it's one reason you see a lot of states, and even at the county level, counties introducing measures to restrict you know, pesticide use in various ways. For instance, establishing buffer zones around schools, uh, nursing homes, and hospitals, because the EPA is not doing that. So states and counties are taking the initiative to but, do but that. But that has nothing to do with GMOs. Nothing to do with GMOs. Conventional crop GMOs. So what you're referring to is a general thing mm -hmm. that had nothing to do with GMO. Not exactly. A lot of the genetically engineered crops, the vast majority, in fact, are herbicide resistant. They, they uh, constitute 85% of the world's genetically engineered crop acreage. They're engineered to be resistant to herbicides so that the herbicide can be sprayed directly on the crop. Right? If they weren't engineered, you couldn't do that. You would kill the crop. So, and so, so this leads to greater quantities and more frequent application of these herbicides. So we, just to cl clarify, we're talking about genetically modified crops that are produced and sold by pesticide companies. And these pesticide companies control 70% 70, 70 of the global pesticide market. So the crops are designed to be applied with pesticides as part of the package. But I agree, we shouldn't be talking about pesticides. When we're talking in Hawaii, we should be talking about how can we develop agricultural systems that turns us away from the use of pesticides, agroecological techniques that r reduces our reliance on external inputs. But unfortunately, with GMOs, we are back to square one with plantations, more pesticides, more chemical applications. And in our view, it's, we're going in the wrong direction. Well, you know, I, I agree with Hector. We, we got to look at <coughs> more sustainability with regards to how we farm. But I, what I see different is there's always room for coexistence. And I say that because on Molokai, we, the seed farmers, we're neighbors to organic, bona fide, certified organic farmers for the past 10 years. We get along perfectly fine. He grows his crop. We do our thing, and we have a fantastic relationship and as and to me it's all about coexistence how we can make things work how we can make uh, what Hector is advocating work and how we can make things like what we do with growing biotechnology in Hawaii work too and the conventional farmer I, I also think you know part of the problem here if if we don't talk about coexistence it's we're talking about things that are gonna affect small farmers too I mean no matter what I mean, basically, you're, you're, you're talking about agriculture in general and some of the problems we have in agriculture, but you take away tools from agriculture. The more you take away tools, the less profitable it's going to be for farmers, one, and the less guys are going to farm because they're not going to be able to make money. So if we have these tools of biotechnology, I'm not just talking about GMO. I'm talking about tools that, that are developed to um, fight um, diseases that come into our state. You know, um, then guys are going to quit. I mean, it's it's hard enough farming, and and making money farming, in any way. Let me ask you uh, about one of the criticisms again, that the processes that are going on in developing these seeds are producing giant bugs or more potent bugs to deal with, and that's one end result of exactly what they're doing out there. So so they're creating more problems down the road for farmers. How, how do you answer that? It's like super bugs is what they're talking you know, about. You know, if, if you're a farmer, you would understand this. Um, even if you're an organic farmer, okay, there's a product called pyrethrin, okay, that we use actually to spray on lettuces and things like that. If I spray that product every week for one month on lettuce, those bugs will, will, will develop a resistance to that pesticide. Whether it's organic or what, it's you got to be smart. Farmers are not dumb. What you got to be able to do is 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 integrate it with other pest control measures in between for these things to continue working going forward. But anybody who uses a pesticide continually for a couple months, those bugs will become resistant. Yeah, Paul, Paul, to add to that, you know, um, and I use this analogy. Uh, 
you know, if you're, if, if you're going to compete against your opponent, you're not going to use the same playbook over and over again. The bottom line is farmers have to farm intelligently. You know, and what Dean is saying is absolutely correct. But do you know exactly what these companies are doing on each of these properties, on this 5% of the Hawaii land, Agua land? Do you but, know what, exactly what they're doing? Well, I work for a seed, uh, the, the, the seed corn uh, yes. farmer. I'm, I, I consider myself a seed corn farmer. I also consider myself a farmer. I farm organic. I farm conventionally. I like all of them. I, and to me, what we do is no different than any other farmer. We're growing seed corn. Somebody else might be growing cantaloupes down the road. They might be growing taro down the road. We all do the same thing. We look at it in, in, in maybe a different way, but we're all looking at it. What is the end result? We want to get a <coughs> good product at the end of the lifespan of the crop that we got in. So if you look, if you look at the uh, production practices in, in Hawaii, for example, of the seed company, we know that they are applying pesticides about seven out of every 10 days. Uh, so this is not looking at integrated pest management. This is basically a spray, 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 spray. Uh, so what do you get? The pests develop resistance. So in the United States, we have about 10 to 20 million acres of land that are resistant to the herbicide Roundup. Now, if you own the seed and if you own the pesticides, you're, you're, you're making a lot of money uh, because Farmers have to buy the seed from you, and they have to buy the pesticides that every few years you have to come up with a new pesticide. So it's almost like, almost like a shell game. You are sp spending a lot of money, and the companies are making a lot of money. Now, should we be thinking about sovereign communities that can grow their own food and take care of their own land without having to rely on seed from a foreign corporation uh, and from f pesticides that you need to bring from out of state? I'd, yeah, like, I'd like to bring in the Kauai example also, uh, which addresses some of the stuff that's been raised here. And that is that Kauai, there's a bill that Gary Hooser has introduced over there uh, as a disclosure bill, which is requiring the, the pesticide companies to disclose what it is they're spraying on the land. That's all it does, just what are you spraying? Uh, Gary told us that he tried to go to the pesticide companies to find out what they were doing, what they were spraying, what amounts they were spraying, and they wouldn't give him the information. And so he therefore is using a legal way to try and get that information. I understand there is a way to get it otherwise and that that is available, not through them directly perhaps, but other ways with public records? No, no. It, it took a lot of effort. I mean, yeah. it, it, if they were really <coughs> interested in being open, I think they would have you know, revealed that information themselves. But if I could just add in a few, few seconds with yeah. the resistance problem, there's no doubt that genetically engineered crops have greatly exacerbated resistance problems. And Hector referred to the Roundup resistant weeds that have been fostered by Roundup ready crops. Now, in order to kill those weeds, there are a bunch of new herbicide-resistant crops resistant to more toxic herbicides like 2,4-D. So it really is a, a treadmill. Uh, well, well, I think we're out through on that yeah. subject. Unless you got, I'll, I'll give I you just, 30 seconds, okay. but he's going to get another 30. Yeah. <laughs> just just to that. comment what Hector is saying. Uh, remember, farmers have choice. Uh, and you know, to say that uh, farmers uh, have to grow these you know, GMO seeds, uh, it's, it's false. They don't have to grow it. They, they make the choices. And these farmers, and, and you know, they rely on these seeds because it helps their bottom line. And, and you know, in, in many ways, they, they, they produce food in a way that's a lot more efficient. I promise I'll get back to you. One yeah. more. Just, mm -hmm. just to give the example in, in, in India. In India, uh, farmers have adopted GM crops uh, so now, pretty much every, all the farmers are, are growing GM crops, uh, but they realized that they need a package of pesticides, fertilizers, if not, the crop doesn't grow well. Uh, so to date, uh, we have seen uh, over 270,000 suicides because farmers got in debt and they couldn't continue paying those, 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 those monies to keep the production. Some of those farmers wanted to go and get the old seed that they used to grow in the old days, but it wasn't longer available because in the market they could only find GMO seed. So you don't, don't always have the option uh, that we're talking about. Uh, talk about some of the complaints about the way you've been operating. Some people say, look, this is just scare tactics. They don't have any really accurate scientific data. What they'll tell you is, okay, down the road this may be bad. 
We just don't know. We just don't know. And, and so then people wonder, what should I do? Should I buy this stuff or not? But I, I, I need some facts to go along with this thing. It, it's very easy, I think, for a farmer to, to think, well, this is going to help me. and I'm, I'm going to, My bottom dollar is going to be better. The bottom line is going to be better. And so they, they go ahead and move toward that, uh, that, that GM approach to, to farming. Um, but because there's been a paucity of information coming out of the seed companies themselves about what their experimental results have shown with the use of this, and because it's a recent kind of thing and there's no long-term data available, and think about asbestos, for example, how long it took to get the information together for something like asbestos or even DDT. Uh, <clears throat> there's, there's that lack of inf information. And so uh, what, what we have to rely on is independent scientists doing that research and finding, finding out the new kinds of things. Well, where's that are the going money on. for that coming from? That's coming out of their pocket to some extent. It's coming out from local funding, from foundations now. Uh, National Science Foundation is now allotting, I think, this year over 500000 for some of that work, but it's only been in the last three years they've been allotting that money. But the results are coming out, and what we're seeing is things like gene transfers between insects. We're seeing uh, what, what the glyphosate effects are on soil. We're seeing uh, lateral gene transfer from fungi to aphids. We're seeing all this, this other stuff. This, this, this kind of stuff is starting to come out. So in the future, I think as independent scientists continue to go on, we're going to see more and more of this kind of information come out. We're going to get the picture opened up. We're going to really begin to see just what the impacts are. What do you expect the consumer to do? Wait, wait for that to happen? <laughs> what does he do when he walks into the store and he sees, uh, okay, you looked at the papaya, it's cheaper than the other one, you know? So part, part, of the, part of the problem is that there has been little disclosure. Uh, consumers are in the dark. They don't know what they're consuming. They don't know who's farming on their backyard. They don't know what's being sprayed. And this, of course, raises a lot of questions, and people start talking, and people become scared. Uh, and I, I do agree that, that some people start making big stories and so on, yeah. but I think it, it's born out of the darkness. We don't know what's going on. Well, well let's, let's uh, talk about Wait, that. Can I, can I first address the India question, okay? Because yeah. that really bothers me when I hear that every time. Because I have, we have a document from a farmer in India. The only thing approved in India for GMO is cotton, one, okay? Two, the government has banned them from growing anything for food, and, and they have, you know, millions of people starving in that country. The farmers want the technology to grow food for, for these people, okay? They have social problems that are far and beyond what, what we have to deal with in, in the United States. So, I mean, this farmer has been lobbying for it, and there's, they have an anti uh, coalition over there that's fighting it. So they're not allowed to grow these things. But so you have millions of people still not having enough food. Yeah. We'll give them their two minutes here and then we'll, we'll get back. Okay. Well, you know, Hector is talking about lack of information and so forth. With the work on papaya, you folks know what I did. You, I've given you all these referee journal publications. You ask me that. I mean, there's no secret about the papaya. <clears throat> hey, I mean, and you know, in the early days when they were trying to control the virus, they wanted to spray pesticides every day to control insects. What is more organic than the gene that we put in the papaya to make it resistant? That's the most sustainable sustainable uh, effort to control a very severe crop. Fifteen years later, nothing happened. Nothing's going to happen there. I, I got time for one more question here. And so in, I, I got one more time. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll let you do that, but that's about the last Yes, in, in terms of the, the, the lack of disclosure, uh, we just learned based on a refereed paper that came out of Europe that over the past 20 years, the GMO papaya had a hidden viral gene that the researchers didn't know about, that the regulators didn't know about, and that the researchers did not report uh, to the Japanese uh, government were to deregulate papaya. So we had a, a hidden ge viral gene that consumers were consuming without knowing that it was there. So our question is, how come this wasn't reported, and what other genes are hidden in the genetic papaya that w it hasn't been revealed to consumers? I want to answer that. That's absolutely false. We reported all of what you saw, and I showed you the data of all this gene. All of the Japanese uh, people 
the regulators saw that. So don't tell me that we did so not. So did you report that. to Japan that, that absolutely that you we gave them all the bioinformatics? No, of all specifically, the did you report to Japan that the promoter, they call the flower mosaic virus, had a added gene segment that had not been identified when you re-regulated the papaya? Well, did you specifically we, tell we, them? We gene gave six? them all of the sequence data for them to look and we analyzed everything there. So did you tell them gene six is included in the, in the traits that were yes, included? Yes, we, 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 we showed them all of the data. So don't tell me that we didn't do that. Yes. And Paul, to, to add what uh, Dr. Steiner said, uh, you know, uh, uh, having independent studies is, is encouraging, and, and that's, that's a good thing. Uh, I think uh, we support that kind of uh, science-based, independent uh, research that is healthy uh, for, uh, you know, whatever we do in our society today. But point in fact is that we have to make sure other scientists can duplicate and replicate that same uh, research. So I just wanted to s say that. And one of the problems with in the area of genetic engineering is that the companies put restrictions on the research that independent scientists can do. In fact, because of the patents on seeds that prohibit farmers from saving seeds from their harvest, those same patents are used by the companies to prohibit independent scientists from doing certain kinds of research. They have to get permission from the Monsanto's and the DuPont's of the world and sometimes agree to allow the company to review their, their uh, manuscripts before they're published. It's really a, a, a stranglehold on independent science, I think. I think that's it for the questions from me tonight. But uh, we've saved time for <coughs> a closing statement from uh, each side. And where we first let off with the uh, pro-GMO, we're going to lead off with our closing two minutes uh, with the anti-faction. Thank you. Um, I'll lead off with that. Uh, just recently, there's been enough studies shown that to show that um, uh, that we've had uh, an increase in in um, using traditional breeding in certain traits of production that have increased the amount of corn that can be produced uh, and the amount of uh, other kinds types of foods that can produce using traditional factors. Uh, we've not seen that in the genetically engineered uh, crops. And uh, that, that might be a problem of maybe con not concentrating on the right kind of factors, uh, but it's still there. It means that traditional breeding is still alive, and it also means that certain universities are starting to go back to traditional breeding now. Um, and that, that also is true for papaya. Just, just not too long ago, and I think Dennis knows this, there was, there was breeders in the Philippines, I believe it was, that, that used techniques, traditional breeding, to actually breed resistant. Uh, papaya resistant to ring spot virus. And so the traditional approaches can work. Uh, and, and you don't need to go to the genetic engineering approaches. Uh, I, think, I think Dennis's approach was a very good approach because he didn't choose to go after insecticide resistance. He went after uh, something that could be uh, very profitable, very useful. But then, on the other hand, when you look at the, what happened to the papaya industry, uh, the USDA itself, uh, statistics show that it went from $23 million of productivity down to four million or five million in the last uh, uh, few years. So something happened there, and, and we have to ask the question, what is affecting that, that, that industry, and why did it do that, even, uh, even though they had uh, protected uh, uh, GMO virus, uh, papaya? Your final message, though, to everybody? I would, I, I would, yes? I would, I would just add that I feel that we're talking almost about the wrong subject, uh, that we should be talking about how can we grow bountiful food in Hawaii to feed ourselves? And the global consensus is saying we should support small family farms to grow ecological style of farming, agroecological farming practices to feed ourselves, uh, to have food sovereignty, food security, uh, and to follow the mandate of the Constitution. And the closing yeah. statement. Well, you know, you've been talking about the papaya. You know, the genetically engineered papaya was developed by public sector scientists, released in 1998, and it saved the papaya industry. And this accomplishment benefits farmers and consumers. Where in the world can you go and get four papaya for a dollar from the farmer's market? And this was done to help the people. And, you know, this was not through biotechnology. My thing is that biotechnology is an option that you really can utilize strategically, 
Now, in Florida, this deadly bacterial disease, the greening disease of citrus, came into Florida in 2005. Remind me of the papaya. The experts just told me that in five years, the industry is going to die if they cannot control this. And you know what they're betting on? Genetic engineering to do that. Again, all of this stuff is trying to utilize your best arsenal to control a disease. Now, you know, we, we live in Hawaii, a lot of food and so forth, but there's a lot of places in the rest of the world that don't have enough food. And I think when you help to feed people, then you make them more uh, self-confidence and independent. And, you know, biotechnology, if it's not working, the people won't adopt it. And what 17 million farmers have adopted this, and much of this is in developed countries and so forth. So this technology has been adopted, and farmers don't adopt things if they're not working. Now, you know, we all know, I think we all agree that farming is a tough job. It really is a tough job. And we should give the farmers a choice of various arsenals to use so that they can make money. Because the farmers succeed, we succeed, we're happy when we go to the grocery stores. And in, in this debate, a lot of the farmers are being lost. In all of this debate, the farmers are being lost. The people who feed us, and, and this is what bothers me. And I was in this stuff for a long time. Thank you. Well, mahalo to all, all our panelists, Adolph, Dennis, Dean, Bill, and William, and Hector for giving us some insight on the pros and the cons of GMO. We can continue to discuss this issue, of course, but more importantly, I think we all want to see thoughtful and innovative planning to seek ways for our community members to work together, hey, <laughs> work together, so that our state can take some positive and responsible next steps toward addressing our concerns surrounding GMO. And we can all do our part by staying informed and engaged. Be sure to visit alelo.org slash GMO to view other GMO, uh, GMO work week, or GMO week, I should say, the GMO week programs and to visit links provided by our panelists. I'm Paul Udell for GMO Week. On behalf of Alelo Community Media, thank you for tuning in, and aloha. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, that, that was late. <clears throat> I thought it was late. Aloha and thank you for tuning in to GMO Week, four nights of active discussion on this often divisive issue. We at Olelo Community Media hope that GMO Week will help all of us gain a better understanding of both the pros and cons of GMO so that our community can create solutions that are in the best interest of Hawaii. The GMO series is our first, but Olelo plans to air similar productions on important community issues in the future. We do not support any position on GMO, but we strongly believe that voices on both sides need to be heard. Freedom of speech and community engagement are what makes our country and our island community great. From all of us at Olelo, mahalo for watching.
Because it's bad. Why is it so bad? It's bad because you're not helping promote peace. Why do we have to promote peace? If we don't, there will be too much violence.